popular pagan prophet meets the angel of the Lord, but not before the donkey he's riding begins speaking aloud. All this today on The Bible Brief. Pick up your Bible and read along with us today. Learning happens better with a Bible in your hand. Israel has completed their trek to the east side of the land of Canaan. Having left their camp at Kadesh to travel in the desert around the area of Edom, they've arrived in the plains of an area called Moab. But their traveling wasn't without issue. On the way, they had been met with resistance by several nations. First, it was some Canaanites living in the southern part of Canaan. Next, it was the Amorites who came against them. And finally, the king of Bashan had come against them. And how did Israel fare? Well, God was with Israel, and God was the might of the nation. In each case, God gave a resounding victory to his people, and in each case, they were able to devastate their enemies to the point of essentially conquering them. Fighting without God is a fool's errand, but fighting alongside the presence of God will give victory every time. Israel rediscovered this in these travels. The same God who had fought for them and for their fathers against Egypt at the Red Sea would fight for them and their children as they took the land of Canaan. These victories were only a foretaste of victories to come. But to take a phrase from a famous world leader of the last century, it's more important to be on God's side than to have God on your side. Israel would need to be obedient to the law, and God would give them victory in their obedience. Disobedience and complaining would bring episodes like those serpents that had afflicted them on their desert trek around Edom. Victory and obedience would go hand in hand for the Israelites. As Israel is here on the border of Canaan, in the plains of Moab, there's a significant shift that occurs in the narrative of the Bible. Since the book of Exodus began, the perspective of the narrative has largely followed Moses and the people of Israel, from their slavery to Sinai, to the wilderness wanderings. But here the perspective shifts away from Israel. Instead, the narrative looks upon some of the enemies of Israel, enemies from the land in which Israel is encamped, enemies seeking to curse this populous and victorious nation. Enemy number one is called Balak, the king of Moab, and enemy number two is called Balaam, the pagan prophet for hire. Let's begin reading, starting in Numbers chapter 22. Verse 2. Balak, the king of Moab, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites in battle. And the country of Moab was in great dread of the people, because they were many. Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, This horde will now lick up all that is around us, as the ox licks up the grass of the field. Balak, the king of Moab, has seen all that Israel did to the Amorites in battle. Those Amorites had defeated Moab previously, and now Israel had defeated the Amorites. You can imagine the fear and trepidation of these people in Moab. The Amorites, the enemy who had conquered them, was replaced by an even stronger rival in the nation of Israel. So Balak the king begins to panic and plot, and his plotting soon leads him into an alliance. Moab and the nation of Midian decide to ally themselves against this nation dwelling in the plains of Moab. Now, presumably Balak, the king of Moab, understands that he can't defeat Israel with the forces of Moab and Midian. Israel is just too strong and too numerous for them to stand a chance. So instead of meeting them on the physical battlefield, he decides to try to fight them on a new plane altogether. He's going to try to fight them in the spiritual realm. So Balak the king sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor at Pethor, to call him, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth, and they are dwelling opposite me. Come now, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. Okay, so Balak the king of Moab decides to send messengers to a man named Balaam. Balaam is a pagan prophet of sorts that was probably similar to fortune tellers and card readers of our own day. He might have tried to read patterns of bird behavior to read the future, 
or do special animal sacrifice rituals to appease the many false gods of the day. In any case, he was not an honorable prophet like Moses. He was a pagan prophet promoting false gods and false worship. And yet he did have a reputation. Balak has his messengers say to Balaam that, I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. Balaam, at least to others, appeared to have the power to bless and to curse. But establishing his reputation isn't the only purpose of this statement. It's also set up as a contrast between this pagan prophet Balaam and God himself. Remember way back in Genesis 12, God had said this to Abraham when he called him from Ur to the land of Canaan. He said, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. As readers, then, we're supposed to see this reputation of Balaam set up against the statements of God. Does Balaam truly have the power to bless and to curse? Or is the power to bless and curse found in God alone? If Balaam has that power, will he indeed curse Israel like Balak wants him to? These questions hang over the narrative. Let's keep reading. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their hand. And they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. And Balaam said to them, Lodge here tonight, and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. And God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt, and it covers the face of the earth. Now come, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to fight against them and drive them out. God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Go to your own land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Balak sends his messengers to Balaam, and oddly enough, upon their request, Balaam waits for a response from Yahweh. And when God gives his response, it's clear. You shall not go. You shall not curse. Israel is blessed. Balaam may have wanted to go, especially to earn those fees for divination that Balak's messengers had brought, but God wouldn't allow it. So despite his desires, God's response to this first attempt is no. But that's not the end of the story. Once again, Balak sent princes, more in number and more honorable than these. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, Let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will surely do you great honor. Whatever you say to me, I will do. Come, curse this people for me. But Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God to do less or more. So you too, please stay here tonight, that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam that night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, rise, go with them, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the princes of Moab. You can tell in the narrative that Balak really wants Balaam to come to Moab. And Balaam himself really wants to go. Balak, after all, had sent princes and an honorable entourage. And while Balaam seems to reject their second attempt, we can tell he really wants to go, because he invites them to stay the night again to see if God will say more to him. Oddly enough, God's second response to this request for Balaam to go to Moab is to allow him to go. But Yahweh has a strict stipulation for this pagan prophet. He says, Only do what I tell you. So Balaam saddles up his donkey and heads to Moab. Now apparently, God was also looking into Balaam's heart as he went along, and God became angry with him. We're not told specifically why God became angry with Balaam. Bible readers have debated this for a long time. It's sufficient, however, to remember that God is weaving this pagan prophet into his story for Israel. Anger at this promoter of false gods and false religion surely wasn't far from every interaction that God had with Balaam. Let's keep reading. But God's anger was kindled as he went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as his adversary. 
Now Balaam was riding on the donkey, and his two servants were with him. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road, with a drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn her into the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards, with a wall on either side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place, where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he struck the donkey with his staff. The angel of Yahweh stands before Balaam as his adversary. But Balaam is none the wiser. He has no idea. He's more blind than his own donkey. This pagan prophet with a reputation for his divination abilities can't even see the angel standing in front of him. And three separate times, the donkey saves Balaam's skin, only to be struck by Balaam for the favor. But the next oddity of the story is perhaps the most significant, a point that we can't forget as the story moves along. God opens the mouth of the donkey. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made a fool of me, I wish I had a sword in my hand, for then I would kill you. And the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey, on which you have ridden all your life long to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in his way with his drawn sword in his hand. And Balaam bowed down and fell on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to oppose you because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside before me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely just now I would have killed you and let her live. Then Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you stood in the road against me. Now therefore, if it is evil in your sight, I will turn back. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only the word that I tell you. So Balaam went on with the princes of Balak. Balaam's eyes are finally open to the reality of the situation. First the donkey speaks to Balaam about her behavior on the road. And then God opens the eyes of Balaam to see the angel of Yahweh with his drawn sword. Apparently the angel was ready to lop off the head of Balaam for his actions. Yet Balaam was saved by his donkey. The Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and this animal with a reputation for dumbness was shown to be even more perceptive than the famous pagan prophet on her back. Balaam is shown to be dumb and blind, more so than the donkey he's riding. And here on this third response of God to Balaam's trick, he repeats his permission and he repeats the condition. God says, Go with the men, but speak only the word that I tell you. Will this pagan prophet obey God's words? Or will his blindness be on display yet again? Will he curse Israel, who is blessed by God? Or will something even stranger happen? Join us next time as Balaam tries to get Balaam to speak against Israel. He tries three times, and he gets more than he bargained for. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible. Copyright Bible Literacy Foundation 2023